Do you believe that Earth is flat or a sphere? Does it even matter to you? The flat Earth approximation actually works quite well in many aspects of our everyday life. We can order a cup of coffee or play a game of golf without worrying about the fine details of planetary shapes. But what if you want to launch a satellite into a space? Now it's important to know whether the Earth is flat or spherical. But let's think a bit deeper about that. Does the Earth really have a spherical shape? A closer look from a space shows that Earth is not a perfect sphere, but an oblate spheroid. This story reflects the evolution of scientific models. Now you might think, how does it apply to organic chemistry? Do we really need to go deeper? To understand the importance of continuously improving our models, let's look at a quiz given to the first year graduate student at Florida State University. The question is, in each pair of compounds, which one is more stable? Pause the video, take a minute, and test yourself. The answers may or may not be surprising, depending on how far you are separated from your undergrad organic class. Take 1,2-difluoroethane as an example. You might think that the two fluorines create serious steric hindrance, so it makes sense that the transform is more stable than a cis conformation. But this explanation is wrong. In other words, relying on steric repulsion here is kind of like using the flat earth model. In all cases, the bottom structure is more stable because of stereoelectronic effects. In this video, you will learn how to see molecules as a quantum object delocalized in a space, far from the flat, two-dimensional drawing on a sheet of paper. By moving from flat Lewis structure to 3D illustrations, you will be able to take the next step in understanding molecular structures. Before going deeper, let's clarify what the stereoelectronic effect is. You might think it's a combination of steric plus electronic effects, but that's not the case. We can define stereoelectronic effect as stabilizing electronic interactions that are maximized by a particular geometric arrangement, which can be traced to a favorable orbital overlap. There are three keywords in this sentence. The first is stabilizing. Stereoelectronic effects are always stabilizing interactions. The second is geometric arrangement, meaning that specific arrangement leads to the stereoelectronic effect. And the last is orbital overlap, meaning this stabilizing effect comes from orbital interactions. The term stereoelectronic effect was first introduced in a paper by Hirschman, who described an unusual ring contracture in recognition. As you can see, during this rearrangement, the 6 membered ring is contracted to a 5 membered ring. Mechanistically, this carbon-carbon bond shifts to this carbon atom that's attached to a good living group. Interestingly, if the mesylate is positioned in the axial position, this rearrangement is not going to happen. Now let's go into 3D space to see what's actually happening. For simplicity, I'm only showing the free fuse ring of this molecule. Look at this carbon-carbon bond and the carbon-oxygen bond. There is a very specific geometric arrangement here. First, these two bonds are planar, meaning they lie in the same plane. Second, they are anti to each other. And third, they are parallel to each other. If two bonds meet with three criteria, we say that they are anti pair planar. Now let's analyze the orbital interactions that lead to the ring contraction. I want to focus on the carbon-carbon and carbon-oxygen bonds. Because of the high electronegativity of the oxygen, the carbon-oxygen bond acts as an acceptor, and the carbon-carbon bond is a donor group, containing two bonding electrons. So we should consider the empty anti-bonding orbital of the carbon-oxygen bond, and the bonding orbital of the carbon-carbon bond. These two orbitals interact to produce new molecular orbitals. Actually, the two electrons of the carbon-carbon bond move into a new molecular orbital that is more stable. As you can see, this new molecular orbital has a lower energy than the original carbon-carbon bonding orbital. So let's wrap up what we understand. Because of the specific geometry, so-called anti-periplanar, the carbon-carbon bond and the carbon-oxygen bond interact. This interaction leads to their stabilization by creating new molecular orbitals, and that stabilization shows itself as a ring contraction. So orbital interaction is the beating heart of stereoelectronic effects, and I want to walk you through how to see reactions from the orbital perspective. The same principle is true for 1,2-difluoroethane. The gauche conformer is 1.8 kilocalories per mole more stable than the anti-conformation. Here you can see the gauche conformation. 
The CF bond is a good acceptor because of the high electronegativity of the fluorine atom. And the CH bond acts as a donor group. Notice that the CH bond is not a particularly strong donor. We call it donor only in comparison to the CF bond. As you see, we have two stereoelectronic effects. Two CH bonds are anti-peripelinar to two CF bonds. So the bonding electrons from the CH bonds interact with the empty anti-bonding orbital of the CF bonds. We can show the flow of these bonding electrons with this resonance structure. In contrast, in the anti-conformation, there is no CH bond anti-peripelinar to any CF bond. So there is no stereoelectronic effect. Until now, we've understood stereoelectronic effects where the electrons in a bond interact with an anti-bonding orbital of a good acceptor. But there is another type of stereoelectronic effect in which non-bonding electrons interact with anti-bonding orbitals. The onomeric effect is a good example of this type of interaction. So let's start with a simple model of onomeric effect. In this compound, the substituent in axial position is more stable than in equatorial position. Here we have the non-bonding electrons on the oxygen atom. On the other side, the carbon-oxygen bond in axial position is anti-peripelinar to non-bonding electrons. In addition, it's a good acceptor because of the high electronegativity of the oxygen atom. In other words, the energy level of the anti-bonding carbon-oxygen bond is low enough to interact with the non-bonding electrons on the ring oxygen. And again, we see the same pattern. Non-bonding electrons and the axial carbon-oxygen bond are anti-peripelinar. That leads to orbital interaction. And that interaction results in stabilization. Now let's analyze a more complex example. The onomeric effect plays a key role in the reactivity of this unstable molecule. We can envision several scenarios for this compound. This carbon atom is attached to three heteroatoms. First, the oxygen with two lone pairs. Second, the nitrogen atom outside the ring. And third, another nitrogen atom inside the ring with one lone pair. One option is that one of the oxygen lone pairs helps the departure of the exon nitrogen to produce the ketone. Another option is the opposite. The non-bonding electrons on the nitrogen help kick off the hydroxy group. In addition, the non-bonding electrons of the oxygen can help rupture the nitrogen inside the ring, leading to the ring opening. To solve such a complex problem, you need to be sensitive to the orientation of the line pairs. Let's start with the oxygen atom. As we can see, one of the line pairs is anti-peripelinar to the carbon-nitrogen bond inside the ring. The other lone pair is anti-peripelinar to the exo-carbon-nitrogen bond. The lone pair of the endonitrogen is anti-peripelinar to the carbon-oxygen bond. On the exo-nitrogen atom, the lone pair is anti-peripelinar to the endo-carbon-nitrogen bond. So there are two identical interactions that strengthen each other. One of the oxygen line pairs and the lone pair of the exo-nitrogen are both anti-peripelinar to the endo-carbon-nitrogen bond. So here we have two onomeric effects dictating the reaction. As a result, the six-membered ring is opened by these two onomeric effects. Anti-peripelinarity is not the only geometry that leads to orbital interaction. Orbitals can interact in many different ways. Bromination of aryl cyclopropane is a good example for our discussion. When phenyl cyclopropane reacts with bromine under free radical conditions, the cyclopropane undergoes a ring opening because the bromine radical attacks a cyclopropane ring. But the 9 cyclopropyl anthracene reacts with bromine under the same reaction conditions, the cyclopropane ring remains untouched, and the brominated product is formed without ring opening. Notice that in cyclopropane ring, there are two types of bonds, the carbon-carbon bonds and the carbon-hydrogen bonds. In phenyl cyclopropane, the bromine radical attacks a carbon-carbon bond and opens the ring. So the carbon-carbon bond is activated and the carbon-hydrogen bond is deactivated. Having said that, in anthracene derivative, the bromine radical attacks the carbon-hydrogen bond. So the carbon-carbon bond is deactivated and the carbon-hydrogen bond is activated. In other words, it undergoes H abstraction. The only way to rationalize this unique reactivity is stereoelectronic effect. First of all, let's have a brief reminder of orbitals in cyclopropane. For describing bonds in cyclopropane from an orbital perspective, we should use the Walsh diagram. Based on the Walsh diagram, there are two types of orbitals. In the first energy level, the orbitals are pointing toward the center of the ring. We call them radial orbitals. In the second energy level, there are two degenerate orbitals distributed 
around the periphery of the ring, known as tangential orbitals. The interesting point here is that these orbitals have a pi character. The radial orbitals are not accessible for the reaction, so we use these homo orbitals when it comes to interaction with other groups like the phenyl ring. Now let's go back to our case. In the phenyl soccer propane, there are two possible conformations known as bisected and perpendicular. The nomenclature is based on the angle between the carbon hydrogen bond and the phenyl ring. Here you can see the bisected conformation in which the carbon hydrogen bond and the phenyl ring are in the same plane and the angle between them is zero. In the perpendicular conformation, the angle between the carbon hydrogen bond and the phenyl ring is 90 degrees. Now we want to see the orbital interactions between the cyclopropane and the phenyl ring. In the bisected conformation, we can see this orbital of the cyclopropane and the phenyl ring are aligned, so they can interact with each other. Notice that the homo orbital of the cyclopropane interacts with the lumo orbital of the phenyl ring. In a perpendicular conformation, the homo orbitals of the cyclopropane are perpendicular to the lumo orbitals of the phenyl ring, so there is no interaction. Because of that, the bisected conformation is more stable than the perpendicular conformation. Now let's go through the reaction mechanism. In radical reaction conditions, there are two possible pathways. First, the bromine radical can attack the carbon-hydrogen bond, producing weak transition states. If the bromine radical attacks the carbon-carbon bond, the ring opens and the reaction passes through this transition state. The reaction chooses a second pass because this transition state is more stable than the other. When the carbon-carbon bond is attacked, the radical transition state is stabilized because it can interact with the phenyl ring. Actually, it becomes the benzylic radical. But when the carbon-hydrogen bond is attacked, the radical is perpendicular to the phenyl ring. So it is not a benzylic radical. So the stereoelectronic effect dictates that the bisected conformation is more stable than the perpendicular conformation in phenyl cyclopropane. When the molecule adopts the bisected conformation, the carbon-carbon bond becomes activated because of the orbital interaction in a transition state. If an anthracene derivative is attached to the cyclopropane instead of a phenyl ring, the situation changes because the perpendicular conformation becomes more stable than the bisected conformation. Here you can see the bisected conformation where the carbon-hydrogen bond and the anthracene moiety are in the same plane. Just like in phenyl cyclopropane, the stereoelectronic effect stabilizes this conformation. But the acidic clash between the hydrogen on the cyclopropane ring and the hydrogen on the anthracene overcomes the stereoelectronic effect. So the perpendicular conformation becomes more stable. Now everything I said for phenyl cyclopropane is reversed. When a perpendicular conformation is more stable, the carbon-hydrogen bonds becomes activated because the transition state can interact with the aromatic ring, and this pathway is more stable.